So today, uh, Dylan will give his second lecture. The title is uh, on the screen. So Dylan, please. Thanks, Jan. Um, thanks again, everyone, for coming and uh, for inviting me here, Jan. This is, uh, it's great to get to talk about this stuff. So today, the title is Perverse Coherent Extensions. Um, and well, here we have it. So the goal of today's lecture is to define some moduli spaces of certain coherent sheets on toric Calabia threefolds, maybe with some mild additional hypotheses, which are going to be equivalent to representations of certain framed quivers with potential. Um, and the basic idea, well, maybe before I go on, let me just say last time we saw that the, you know, the Hilbert scheme of C2, as I'll recall, had a description in terms of a Nakajima quiver. And the idea is to generalize this to describe some spaces of sheaves that are kind of like Hilbert schemes, but maybe supported on the sheaves are on the threefold, but supported on a divisor. So they still sort of look like sheaves on a surface. Um, and they're going to have a description in terms of a quiver with potential. And the idea is going to be that the threefold itself is going to determine a kind of unframed quiver such that the full stack of representations of the quiver with potential will be equivalent to a certain moduli space of compactly supported sheaves on Y, coherent sheaves. Um, really, they'll be complexes of such, but they're living in uh, some abelian subcategory, not the usual heart, but some other heart of db co y. And then if we fix some additional object, which is uh, not necessarily compactly supported, together with an auxiliary choice, which won't feature too prominently, but I'll explain a bit about it at the end, and it's called a framing structure. Sorry, um, Dylan, what mean what the notation mean? Because we don't have to understand what means this T. It's what uh, T equivalent sorry. or something T, else. T means T equivariant. We're, yeah, sorry. So T is the structure torus of this uh, toric threefold. That's uh, right. Thanks. Sorry. So it's just T equivariant shift. This is it. Yeah. Compact yeah. Shifts, rather. Okay. Exactly. In in reality, in fact, there are um a list of other kind of technical hypotheses, which I probably won't actually get around to, you know, stating the full list of hypotheses today. Um, but it's they're they're not too dramatic. And the typical thing you should have in mind is that you should take a structure sheath of a subvariety and shift it down in cohomological degree by one. And I'll kind of recall what we talked about last time for the Hilbert scheme of C two. And uh, and that we'll see that the structure sheaf of C2 shifted down in cohomological degree by one is going to feature there. And we're kind of generalizing the role of that gadget, but I'll, I'll say more about that in a second. Um, but so we fix this sort of auxiliary object M that's not necessarily compactly supported um, together with this additional data, which I, I don't want to emphasize too much right now. And similarly, we'll show that there under these hypotheses, there exists a framed quiver with potential, uh, which is isomorphic to a certain larger moduli space, or I mean, I'm writing the full stacks here. So a certain stack of coherent sheaves on Y. And again, complex as such, but again, they'll be living within a certain kind of exotic heart of db co y And what will this moduli space roughly speaking be? It will be a moduli space of pairs or a stack of pairs, E comma phi, analogous to the description of the Hilbert scheme that we gave last time, um, where E, the, the underlying kind of complex of coherent sheaves, E is an iterated extension of M with itself, together with all of the possible compactly supported coherent sheaves that are in this moduli space or kind of that are parametrized by this stack M of Y. And again, I haven't told you exactly what those are. The keyword there is perverse coherent. So these compactly supported perverse coherent sheaves together with this auxiliary object. And we'll look at the space of all possible iterated extensions of all those guys together inside of this kind of exotic abelian category. That's E will be isomorphic to such an object. And phi will be an isomorphism from the underlying iterated extension of just M with itself 
ignoring the compactly supported sheaves, an isomorphism from that to some fixed choice of such an iterated extension. So for example, there's always uh, the trivial extension of R copies of M. That's one perfectly reasonable choice. And if you picked your framing structure to be that, then this the data of var phi here would be an isomorphism with that object. So these uh, compactly supported uh, shifts, they will not appear anywhere in the definition of phi. Uh, that's right, exactly, yeah. Again, there's a slightly nuanced hypothesis that I'm probably not gonna explain today that allows you to make sense of the kind of underlying iterated extension of M. I kind of said that in words, in general, that's there's not exactly an operation if you have you know some extension of a bunch of objects. You can't just like throw away some subset of those in general. But we'll under some mild hypotheses, which hold in the examples of interest, you'll be able to make sense of that. Okay. So or question. Yeah. Um yeah, so but uh, but E really is uh it's supposed to be playing the role of like torsion free sheaves, right? Uh absolutely. And and so we're all the pieces thinking of this as a complex or something like that. Um, all the pieces will still be torsion free or something. Or how can I say it's more like this. So we described the torsion free sheaves in the special case that was the Hilbert scheme. We explained that they could, they sort of looked like they were built out of a single copy of the structure sheaf of C2 together with some compactly supported sheaves on C2. They were kind of an extension of those where we shift the structure sheaf, uh, and so down a degree, so an extension of that with something just looks like a map from it. So we said that like a point in the Hilbert scheme sort of looked like a map from some from the structure sheaf of C2 to some compactly supported coherence sheaves on C2, maybe with some stability condition that kind of the image generated um, or the map of sheaves was onto. And so, in, in that situation, we had this extra data that we picked an isomorphism of the double dual of our sheaf with the trivial bundle, with the, the, with the structure sheaf of Z2. And mm -hmm. that's kind of like the data of our phi. OK, yeah, that makes sense. And I'll, I'll recall, I'll start by recalling the, the C2 kind of cartoon or sort of baby case. Of course, it's not a threefold, so it doesn't quite fit into this family of examples, but I'll start by recalling what we talked about last time there, uh, kind of sort of from this perspective before launching into the kind of abstract stuff. So without okay, further right. ado, let me do that. Um, so recall last time we defined the Hilbert scheme, which was some variety. And we also introduced in, in kind of the discussion of the proof of the uh, identification of the Hilbert scheme of C2, with representations of this quiver, stable representations, we introduced another stack, which was the stack of compactly supported coherent sheaves on C2, which had a dimension of their space of sections n. So, uh, so we introduced both these gadgets. And we saw that if we just looked at the underlying quiver without the framing, which showed up in that setting, with relations that the, the two sort of endomorphisms here commute, we argued that the, the stack of representations of this quiver without framing was the same as the stack of compactly supported sheaves on C2. And the argument, the sort of most heuristic way of explaining it is, suppose you had some compactly supported sheaf, coherent sheaf on C2, you can take its space of sections. That's basically the same thing as you know, the underlying vector space of the module, because C2 is affine. And then the endomorphisms bi of the space of sections were given by multiplication by the coordinate functions, which is obviously all the data that you need to prescribe to give a, uh, a module over C join x, y. So that was the kind of heuristic explanation of one direction. And then the slightly more a uh, clever argument to go in the other direction was that if we have a choice of quiver representation given by this vector space with these two endomorphisms, we can form the following complex, which looks like we took a causal resolution of the structure sheaf of a point, say the structure sheaf of the origin, um, 
And then we took sort of dimension V many copies of that. We use V as kind of a multiplicity space. And then we deformed it by the data of these endomorphisms BI. So for example, if V was one dimensional and the BIs were just some numbers, that determined kind of the point that the, the structure sheet uh, uh, of which we're kind of resolving here. And more generally, if BI, you know, for example, was some nilpotent matrix that wasn't zero, it would be giving some kind of describing some kind of extension of these structure sheets of points into the structure sheaf of like a fuzzy point near the origin, um, which was the, basically the correspondence was like those those extension classes are represented by some maps between the Kazool resolutions of the structure sheaves. And we, that's kind of where we put these BIs in. We kind of tensor the maps between the Kazool resolutions with these, these matrices acting on the multiplicity spaces. And that is some kind of slick way of writing down this structure sheaf of, uh, or pardon me, um, this general compactly supported uh, coherent sheaf on C2. And here I've written H bullet. In this case, the cohomology will be concentrated in degree plus one, um, the way it's written here. Uh, but in, in general, the cohomology might not always be just in one degree, I mean, in kind of general construction. Now, <clears throat> so this was the argument sort of just for the unframed quiver. And then we also defined a framed variant, which I didn't have space to fit on the slide, but let me just try to kind of draw it over the slide here. Um, can I make this red or something like that? Uh, where did the color go here? Um, so this was given by, we, the most important thing was we had an arrow coming to this main object or the main vertex here, V, just from a one-dimensional framing vertex. And this was kind of the data of the map from the structure sheaf of C2 to this compactly supported coherent sheaf, which in the case that it's onto allows us to interpret it as some quotient of the structure sheaf, which is then the structure sheaf of some zero dimensional subscheme, which is the kind of thing we want to parameterize in the Hilbert scheme. And really in general, the more canonical thing to draw in this situation, as maybe many of you know, is the ADHM quiver, where you would have another arrow going the other way as well. And this arrow didn't feature in the description we gave last time, because it turns out that in the rank one case on the stable locus, this other endomorphism J is canonically zero. But if you move off the stable locus and you want to describe the full stack of representations of this framed quiver that I've drawn here, J actually does play a role. And so it's important to keep it in. And I want to emphasize that the types of descriptions we give are always of the whole stacks, which I think even in this ADHM example is not an especially well-known thing. I only know of one place in print where I've seen a description of the full stack of representations of the ADHM quiver. And indeed the description is in terms of so-called perverse coherent sheaves. And it appears in a paper of Braverman, Fangelberg and Gatesquery uh, about sort of uh, Uhlenbeck spaces and affine Lee algebras. I think that's the title. Oh, I, I, I am a bit confused. You mean that you consider representation of this quiver with red arrows and no further restrictions like stability? It's, it's I think it's symmetric power of C square. That's it. I think that that is the affinization. But I mean, so uh, so the full in Kajima's lectures, I believe that's that's example because one is uh, kind of imposing stability. Yeah, you resolve indeed. It's like map from a full JT to a fine JT. It's more or less when you impose stability condition, you of course you kills the arrow, but uh, you have a map, you, you, you kill the arrow J, but I think you have a map from, well, you have a Hilbert Chow map from stable to, to from full JT to- Yeah, 
So that's the categorical quotient. Like you're thinking of what do you get if you define a space as the spectrum of the yeah. invariance inside of functions on the vector spaces. Yeah, but something yeah. you can in instead do is look at the quotient stack. You can just take ah, the spaces okay, of endomorphisms. Okay, not, the, not the scheme. And that's bigger. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah, All exactly. Right. And that is a stack that has a geometric description. But giving that geometric description is a little bit more nuanced. On the other hand, in easy examples when you already know the monad formalism, in a way you can just read it off because what can you do? So you can write down the monad for this thing, uh, which we have here. And as we said last time, this is the, the isomorphism is given by taking a, a representation, a, a potentially stable representation, and then mapping it through here. But if you drop stability, then, I mean, this is still a perfectly good complex of coherent sheaves and you can, Think about all of the complexes of coherent sheaves that are parameterized by the space of choices that you make here. And uh, you'll see that that has some, in general, like for example, you could take i to be zero, and then this thing will be concentrated in several cohomological degrees. Um, but it has some kind of slick description, and it, it turns out it's some category. Well, I mean, I can say what it is. It's generated by all of the iterated extensions of structure sheaves of points together with a single copy of the structure sheaf of C2 shifted down in degree by one. And you can kind of see that, for example, if you turn off all of the, the endomorphisms in the quiver representation, you set them all just to zero, then what do you have here? You have a direct sum of dim V many copies of the structure sheaf of a point together with a copy of the structure sheaf of C2 shifted down in degree by one. And in general, when you turn back on those, uh, those endomorphisms in the quiver representation, you should think that you're kind of deforming this direct sum into some kind of iterated extension. And that as you consider all possible quiver representations, you're filling out the face of all possible extensions of these objects. And inside of here, there's a copy of the Hilbert scheme as the stable locus. So this is going to be the flavor of the general construction. We'll have some principal quiver associated to a threefold. It'll be a quiver with potential instead of a Nakajima quiver. Um, the heuristic there is it's kind of three-dimensional instead of two-dimensional. Um, and then there'll be some framing coming from this choice of auxiliary object, which in this example is like the choice of the structure sheaf of C2 shifted down by one. OK. So now I'm just going to explain how do you build, without proving anything about why it's related to coherent sheaves, how could you build a quiver associated to a threefold? And so here are the kind of technical hypotheses necessary uh, following work of Bridgeland. We'll consider a small resolution. By small here, I just mean that the dimensions of the fibers are less than or equal to one of an affine tort Calabia threefold. And then we have this mild additional technical hypothesis, maybe it's not actually so mild, uh, that the derived push forward of OY is OX, no higher cohomology. So in this setting, uh, you can always do the following thing, uh, but I'm gonna be a bit vague about exactly the construction for now. I'll give some examples on the next slide, but you can choose some projective generators. So they're not actually projective objects in coherent sheaves on Y, but they will be projective in some alternative heart. So you know that there are no higher X. So you choose some, some kind of nice generators for your category. Let me call them EI. And in fact, you can choose them all to be the EIs to be line bundles. So E is a vector bundle. And then you can choose some other objects, which will be compactly supported not necessarily coherent sheaves. They might be some kind of, uh, you know, there might be some cohomological shifts or something like that, but which have the property that the space of Holmes from EI to FJ is delta IJ times, uh, you know, the one dimensional sort of base field here. Mm -hmm. um, so, sorry, this set I capital, yeah. what is it? The so yeah the so there'll be some finite yeah, yeah yeah the statement is that there exists some finite index set 
which uh, if you imagine, so under these hypotheses, the fiber, uh, the kind of interesting fibers will be some union of P1s. And you can think that this index set is like the number of P1s plus one in the kind of interesting fiber. Again, I'll give some concrete examples of this construction on the next slide. I'll give three examples. Um, and I'll, I'll explain sort of everything I'm about to say in those examples. Um, but let me go on. So when you fix these two choices of data, you can, there are two natural algebras that you can consider. One of them is the kind of tilting algebra defined by these generators. So this is the endomorphism algebra of this, this vector bundle. Um, it's, it's some concentrated in degree zero algebra. On the other hand, you can consider the X algebra of these kind of compactly supported, typically they end up being simple in sort of simple objects, again, in the relevant part. Um, these simple objects, Fi, direct some of them, you consider this X algebra. And this condition that the Homs between Ei and Fj are satisfied this delta Ij times the base field, tells you that you can think of both of these algebras as augmented over a direct sum of copies of the base field. Here, the, the point is that the objects Fi under the kind of tilting equivalence, when you Hom out of E, they become just some module with underlying vector space K. And that, that gives you your augmentation just by acting, acting on that module. And similarly so, for Dylan, and, and the X, I'm a bit confused in the notation, whatever. And means in the derived category or what? It can, but as I was commenting, these generators are projective in a certain part. So yeah. there's, no, there's no higher X here. So I was just emphasizing that. I could have written X in, in both places potentially, but this will be or, or, end in, or end in both cases because in the derived category x is home so then indeed yeah. of course yeah but so you I want just to want to stress that uh, they belong uh, they belong to some abelian category uh, and is it the same abelian category yeah yeah. yeah they'll both be in the same abelian category that's absolutely right. But I, moreover, I wanted to stress that here there are higher X and here there are not. And the next statement I'm about to make is that in addition to both of these algebras being augmented, this setup actually implies that one algebra is the causal dual of the other. And by causal dual, I simply mean if you have an algebra with an augmentation S, you can take the space of endomorphisms of the augmentation module this is derived here. Uh, I've given yet another notation, <laughs> my apologies. Um, so you can take the derived homs of S with S over sigma. And this gives some algebra, which is called the causal dual. And in this situation, the causal dual of sigma will be lambda. And the That's, reason I... Sorry again, your K has characteristic zero or what is it? Yeah, definitely. Let's say I'm just over C. I, I, yeah, I just want to be over C. I'm probably I shouldn't have written K really, but I think you um, just to have it. Yeah. So in particular, if, is it uh, possible that your set I capital has just one element? Yeah. So as I'll explain, in the case of C three, which will be the simplest example, there will be just one element. E will be the structure sheaf of C three. F will be the structure sheaf of a point. They clearly satisfy this condition. And then lambda will be the endomorphisms of the structure. I mean, I'm going to say this all on the next slide, but it will be the structure mm -hmm. sheaf of C3, which is the symmetric algebra in three generators. Sigma, the X algebra of a point, will be, or of the structure sheaf of a point, will be an alternating algebra on three generators. Yeah, and of course, yeah. these are causal dual. So that's the basic example to have in mind. Okay. Yeah. Um, and Part of the reason I chose to use this end and X notation is because this is the notation I believe that was used and the kind of language that was used in this very famous paper of Balenson, Ginsberg, and Zergel called 
Kazul duality patterns in representation theory. And there they considered the endomorphisms of the projective objects in category O and the xd algebra of the simple objects in category O and explained a kind of Kazul duality between them. And many features that they explained there will appear in the story here. So there's quite a strong analogy with that setting. And I think it's a very nice way of thinking about it. If you're a graduate student in kind of representation theory, if you haven't read this paper, I think it's a very nicely written paper to read. And it explains a lot of some kind of cool structural aspects of representation theory that appear uh, in many kind of analogous guises in other situations. Very nice uh, paper. So yeah. could you just say the names of the authors again? Yeah, Balenson, Ginsburg, Zergel. But uh, Kazul duality patterns has become kind of a, a famous turn of phrase in uh, the relevant areas of math. So that if you search that, it will surely be the first uh, first answer. Thanks. So no worries. Um, thanks everyone for the questions. So we can compute in this situation the endomorphism algebra here, or the, the X algebra of, of this augmentation module by using the Kazul resolution. And the answer, I don't want to go through the computation, but it's not difficult. You could take it as an exercise. But maybe that, explain the notation. Yeah, of course. Yeah. The answer is that you get uh, a model for this algebra lambda as a DG algebra, where the underlying uh, graded algebra is just the tensor algebra on the dual of sigma shifted up in degree by one. And here by a bar, I just mean uh, the augmentation ideal. So just inside of sigma, there's sort of a single copy. It's an X algebra. So there's a, some simple object. So there's a copy in degree zero of the base field. That's like the identity. And you need to excise that from, from sigma to build a slightly smaller vector space. Again, I'm going to give examples in, in a minute, but uh, this is what sigma bar denotes. So you dualize it, you shift it up by one, and you take the tensor algebra. And then there's a natural differential that you can define on this uh, algebra, which is simply given by taking the linear duals of all of the A infinity structure maps on this X algebra. So if you are not afraid of co-algebras, you don't have to dualize, then probably there will be a little bit simpler. At least you save on, on checks. Yeah. I absolutely agree. On the other hand, the main point I wanted to make about this is that when you stare at this formula, when you take a tensor algebra over a semi-simple base ring like the S that we have here, that essentially is the process of forming the path algebra of a quiver. So sigma here, sigma dual, sigma bar dual shifted by minus one, whatever it is, it's the module or bi module over this semi simple base ring. And taking the tensor algebra on it is the same thing as forming the path algebra. And this differential is going to implement some relations on the path algebra which in a minute I'll explain can be deduced from a potential. And the, the very the very right notation mean one, means what? Okay. This means yeah, the, huh? path, yeah. the path algebra of the of a quiver, which I'm calling QY, together with potential WY. So the okay. quotient of the path algebra. Ah, the quotient, okay. The by the, yeah, or maybe I should mean, you know, maybe you should take, I guess what people maybe call the Ginsburg algebra, the kind of derived, like non-commutative derived critical locus, if you want to interpret this literally, because here on the left, I have a DG algebra. So the kind of what people would call the Ginsburg algebra is, is modeled uh, by the left-hand side here. So in this case, the W actually is the potential because there are many other relations, but not all of those can come from a potential. Yeah. The, WY is a, a potential. I think in this setting, though, my claim is that all of the relations will indeed come from this, this potential. OK. So, so here, as I was sort of saying in words a second ago, QY, by definition, will be the graded quiver whose vertex set 
is given by the index set i that we fixed. And where the edge set, the kind of, you know, again, I'm being a bit uh, free between passing from the kind of DG setting and the non DG setting. You could take the degree zero piece if you're worried, but the edge set, the kind of K linear span of the edge set is identified with this, uh, you know, shifted dualized augmentation ideal in sigma. Uh, sorry, I know that's a bit of a mouthful, but I'll say something more concrete in a second. But the point is, if you just plug this in to the formula we have up here, taking the tensor algebra over a semi simple base ring, which is a direct sum over the vertex set of copies of the base field, taking the tensor algebra over that ring of the, the bi module given by the K linear span of the edge set, that is precisely the definition of the path algebra of a quiver. And as I was saying, there's a canonical differential that's induced by dualizing the A-infinity structure maps of sigma. And it turns out it's not too hard to see that the fact that you have a calabi yau structure tells you that, in fact, you can repackage all of the relations that come from having this differential around, taking, say, H0 with respect to it, if you like. And you can repackage those relations as being the kind of non-commutative derived critical locus equations for a potential that you kind of build canonically using the calabi yau structure and these multiplication maps. Again, it's not too hard to see how that goes. I mean, for example, there's a, a great textbook with lots of information in it that was written by um, Kinsevich Soibelman about derived deformation theory and surely all of these constructions appear at various points in there. Uh, well, I just want to make sure that uh, on the previous line, the all the equivalence or the equalities or the algebra, all, all of this are regarded as a DG algebra or as an infinite algebra. Um, as DG algebras. So just the, that means that the quiver is also the, the KE, Q, the, Edge space actually is a complex in this case, right? Um, it's it's so far not a complex, but it's a great it's graded. That's right. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's, it's you a, also a have a differential, some some sort of a differential. Yeah, there won't be an in. You can imagine that you take cohomology when you build this X uh -huh. algebra. There could be an internal differential that you could leave around, but it's perfectly okay. fine to take cohomology, do homotopy transfer, and keep track of the full A infinity structure. And that's kind of the perspective. Uh, I, I'm I, I can see the harm of uh, uh, S to S over sigma, which is the graded algebra. But in the middle here, which is uh, is an algebra with a differential, so it looks like uh, to uh, be a so DG algebra. He, yeah, here I mean R harm. Sorry, I, I said uh, this in words. Here I mean R uh, harm. I'm drawing with my mouse. I should pick up. So you you regard that as a infinite algebra in this case, or? Uh, or I, I think it's probably reasonable I could pick a, a DG, mo to, DG model, just a, a DG, DG algebra. DG algebra. Okay. But here, maybe the only thing that was really a lie is this part where I wrote lambda mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. the rest of this. Really, lambda is H0 of any of these equivalent things. OK. OK. Um, and but, on the right hand side of with the take Q Y, Q is a quiver this time. And it's an it's not just the quiver, it's a grid the quiver actually also has even more structures. So <laughs> here by QI, I actually I sort of mean there are different ways you can think about this. You could say <laughs> this is the path algebra on a graded quiver, uh -huh. or you could extract an underlying plane quiver by just remembering the degree zero piece here. But in that case, you should interpret K as the Ginsburg algebra of your plane quiver. And okay. it's equivalent to say the Ginsburg algebra of the plane quiver or to consider this kind of path algebra on this graded quiver. Yeah, probably uh, that will be clear for later on from in your examples. Yeah, exactly. So let me just emphasize though. So this was all kind of a mouthful, but at the end of the day, the story is this. You get this set of generators. It has some index that I, the index set determines the vertices of a quiver. And the number of edges between two vertices is given by the dimension of the x1 group between fi and fj. Mm 
And this should remind you of what I was explaining on the previous slides, that the, the endomorphisms induced by a quiver representation corresponding to the, the edges of the quiver, they end up determining certain maps between the causal resolutions of these compactly supported objects, which represent extension classes between the compactly supported objects. And here we see that kind of coming out of the construction. We see that the edges are determined by extension classes between these compactly supported objects. OK, so let's get to some examples. So the simplest example, as I was saying in words earlier, is you can take y to be c3, e to just be the structure sheaf of c3, and f to be the structure sheaf of a point. The xed algebra of the structure sheaf of a point is an alternating algebra on three generators, can be expanded as so. On the other hand, the kind of tilting algebra in this case, I mean, you just have an affine variety, so you can just take the structure sheaf, perfectly good tilting object, and it's column for, to itself will just be the global sections. And of course, this is a symmetric algebra on three generators, which is, of course, causal dual in the usual classical way to, a, uh, to an alternating algebra. And finally, let's remember what is our prescription for drawing the quiver. Our prescription is we should look at the index set, which in this case was just one. So we should just draw a single vertex. And how do I make this disappear? Um, oh, that's so annoying. And here, the x1 group is the relevant group. It's here, and it's three-dimensional. So we should draw three loops, because the x1 group is three-dimensional. And everything is you know, from the same single index to itself. And now, I didn't quite tell you the rules for driving the potential, but it turns out the potential in this case, if we call these b1, b2, and b3, the potential is given by b1, b2, b2, b3. And this should remind you of the quiver that we drew in the c2 case. It's very similar. And it's not hard to sort of just eyeball that it looks like, oh, maybe I shouldn't go that far yet. It looks like the representations of this quiver, if we had relations that these bi's commuted, which turns out to be precisely the critical locus equations for this potential, the representations of this quiver are clearly the coherent, compactly supported coherent sheaves on C3, perfectly in analogy with the C2 case that we explained above. So this is kind of the basic story. And here, there's nothing funny. We really just have honest, compactly supported coherent sheaves. There's no exotic heart because there's no resolution happening here. The exotic heart sort of comes into play when you have this resolution. But again, I'm not going to say much about the details of the, the relevant hearts. OK, so to just kind of speed through a couple more examples, if we take the total space of O plus O minus 2 over P1, we can take uh, the vector bundles O and O of 1, where by O of 1 here, I mean the pullback of OP1 of 1 to the total space. And then uh, complementarily, we can take the kind of compactly supported generators to be the push forward of the structure sheaf of P1 and of the structure sheaf of P1 twisted by minus 1, shifted down in a cohomological degree by 1. And this is a result of. Bridgeland and Vandenberg that these are some simple, these are sort of all of the simple objects in a certain exotic card of DB Co um, in the compactly supported uh, category. So it's, and, uh, it's a total, sp it's, uh, it's a neighborhood of, of P1 embedded in the three Calabiao. What? One, one of the possibilities. Yeah, another one is probably of one plus of minus one. And I is what? It's an embedding of P1 into this Y, yeah. That's right, sorry, yeah. I here is the, or Eoda maybe it is, is the embedding of, of P1 into Y. That's right, it's a zero section. Hmm. Okay. 
So now the this sort of um, text algebra will decompose now. We're going to have, of course, in our quiver, we should now have two vertices because the index set is arity two. So we should have some kind of v0 and v1. And then there are potentially air, like could be loops for on the v0 and v1, and there could be uh, there could be errors between them. And indeed, it's sort of an easy calculation uh, to see that the dimensions of the groups are given as follows. So that means that we should expect one loop from each of these guys to themselves and two arrows going in between. Um, and it's maybe worth noting that this is the tripled affine A1 quiver. Tripled in the sense of Ginsburg or whatever. And somehow that has to do with the fact that here we're studying the A1 singularity times C. And I, I, I won't write the potential. I just have to look in the paper for that. Um, and now similarly, uh, we can play the same game on O minus one plus O minus one. We basically have the same generators uh, as before, but now there will be no self X because this is a minus one minus one curve, it's rigid, but there will still be the same number of arrows in between. So the relevant quiver looks like a kind of simpler version where you just have arrows like this, some arrows like this, and this quiver was discovered actually by some physicists, I think first, Klebanov and Witten. And uh, it was in the same context of doing some kind of string theory calculations on this background. Um, but I think from a more mathematical perspective, you should understand it as coming from this construction. Uh, you didn't try the potentials, yeah. That's right. I'm running a little bit slow on time, so- ah, Okay, uh, you, have to... you can just say a polynomials of what degree? We would be right. So maybe it's worth noting, right. So here the potential is cubic because uh, there are only classical multiplications on the X algebra. What should I call them? M2? Or maybe I should call it M1. Whereas here the potential will be quartic since there are uh, non-trivial A infinity brackets. Uh, and now the natural question, of course, is how should we interpret the representations of these quivers and their framed variants, which will be introduced later, in terms of coherent sheaves on Y? So how do we sort of follow through with the idea that we should have an equivalence between representations of these quivers and certain uh, categories of coherent sheaves? Um, so I'm going to have to go a bit faster. So recall we have this E and F, our kind of projective and simple. And we have the end algebra, the endomorphism algebra of the projectives, the extension algebra of the simples. And in, in general, you'll have the following equivalences of categories. So here, the first equivalence I write here, homing out of E, this is the usual kind of tilting equivalence when you have a generator like E. And you get an equivalence with the category of the derived category of modules over lambda, the endomorphism algebra, as usual. And then on the right-hand side here, this equivalence is the standard Kazool, like the Kazool duality equivalence of categories. So whenever you have two Kazool dual algebras, there's a way of setting up uh, a kind of equivalence of categories between them using actually fairly similar technology. And I've set it up this way. So under this equivalence, the objects EI, uh, they'll go to the sum ends of Lambda, which are some projective modules. And then under Kazool duality, the projectives correspond to simples. Again, I would encourage you to read this BGS paper for some background on classical Kazool duality. Similarly, the, uh, the compactly supported objects Fi by this HOM EIFJ is delta IJ condition, they correspond to some simple modules, which are just the underlying vector spaces of which are one dimensional. And then the simples actually map to the injective objects in sigma, sigma modules. And then here you can sort of write some general formula for 
how to describe the uh, the object corresponding to a general object M in dbco y here. What's the last N means? Here, this means Nakayama dual, which is, it's something almost like linear dual. Uh, it's it's a kind of auto-equivalence of the, the category here that swaps the injectives and the projectives. So often, and this is one of those cases, there's a situation where there's kind of a symmetry between projectives and injectives, uh, which is more or less given by taking linear duals. Uh, and, and that's what the, the N here stands for Nakayama. But again, concretely, at the level of underlying vector spaces, it's literally taking the linear dual. Okay, so, so in, now... So in this case, both lambda and sigma has have a finite global dimension. So one can, right? So one can... Yes, right. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Um, so here, let me state something I'll call it a theorem. Uh, we wrote a proof of it, but it's, I think, especially in the case where there's no auxiliary object M, the statement that's happening on the left-hand side and above here, this is a very well-known sort of to experts folklore theorem. And as I said, it follows from results of Bridgeland and Vandenberg. Um, and of course, we'll use also a lot of general kind of triangulated categories technology and Bondal and Orlov are among names that definitely contributed a lot to this uh, field, Kapranov. I mean, there are lots of people I could be listing here. Um, but the point is that inside of here, we can look at the compactly supported coherent sheaves, and they'll correspond to finite dimensional modules over lambda. And then we can ask inside of finite dimensional modules over lambda, or in general, inside of lambda modules, the derived category of lambda modules, there's like the obvious classical heart of just plain lambda modules, not complexes and such. And it's natural to ask, what is the geometric description of this kind of usual natural heart? Which remember, lambda is the path algebra of our quiver. So this heart is actually the heart that describes quiver representations, right? This is the thing we care about, finite dimensional modules over the path algebra of our quiver. And it turns out the results of Bridgeland tell you that this heart corresponds to a heart that he calls the perverse coherent heart in Y. And if we assume this finite dimensionality, again, we see the compactly supported perverse coherent sheets. And so the corollary, the sort of result that we deduce is that there's an equivalence of stacks between the stack of representations of this quiver with potential that we constructed on the previous slide and the stack of compactly supported perverse coherent sheets on why. Uh, now, Dylan, I understand that yeah. you kind of, you're in a hurry, having a few minutes left, but uh, is it uh, ordinary uh, kind of, when you say stacks, you mean what? So in, I mean, in, in the for these case, is it in, induct, inductive limits of Artian stacks? Because I might... Yeah. These will actually be honest algebraic stacks on the left-hand side here. Mm -hmm. um, like Artin, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. On the right-hand side, these objects are a bit too big, as I'll, I could explain maybe in a second. But after we fix this additional data of the framing structure, which we haven't fixed yet, that will also cut them down to size. And they'll again be Artin stacks. But for now, these guys on the right are very big gadgets. Uh, I'm not sure that I have. I, I think even uh, uh, on the first uh, equivalence, your stacks are graded. So then for each uh, component, that's true. you are right. But otherwise, yeah. Sorry. Of course. Yeah, that's absolutely true. These things are disjoint unions over components. And yeah, that's, sorry. You're, of course, right. So in that sense, yes, you could call them an inductive limits of our stacks. Yeah, that's that's totally fair. I guess you would say like in the art. Um, yeah, thanks. You're right. Um, but here, even component wise, these things are still too big. And that's that's kind of part of the problem here. So let me talk about the right hand side. So this is kind of a theorem in two parts. The left hand side I just stated sort of in words. Uh, this is all sort of folklore. And then our kind of contribution, if there is sort of any here in this categorical sort of abstract part, is to explain that you can run a similar argument 
after introducing an auxiliary object that's not necessarily compactly supported. So when you do that, you can consider an algebra extending the, which I'll call sigma m, which is just the x algebra on f plus m. And in terms of the quiver, this corresponds to adding an extra node on the quiver, which corresponds to this framing object. It's not a framing node net yet. Right now, it's an honest extra node. Um, and it could potentially have like an infinite dimensional base ring if M has interesting endomorphisms, which is part of the problem here. When you don't fix this framing structure, this category is sort of becoming very large and you need to kind of tame it somehow. And that's the role of the framing structure. But you'll have arrows between F and M, again, given by the X'd ones between the objects. And you'll also potentially have loops just based at the what will become the framing uh, vertex, but for now it's an honest vertex. You'll have some loops there corresponding to the self extensions of M, the auxiliary object you fixed. And then you can play the same game. You can define, um, sorry, this is in the way, some lambda, lambda M, which is the causal dual of sigma M over the extended base ring where you Again, you add an additional sum end to the base ring, which is the uh, endomorphisms, the n zero of M. And, uh, and again, that could be infinite dimensional if M is sort of not compactly supported. And you have to be a bit cautious working with these very large categories, but nonetheless, you can define them. So there's something called dbcoM, which is the thick subcategory. By thick, I mean triangulated and strictly full, generated by the object F, together with M, hopefully you can see this. Whereas dbcoCS, the compactly supported derived category was generated just by these objects F. So again, I'm just sort of throwing in this extra generator, looking at the category that I build inside of here. This will, by similar formal arguments, be equivalent to some big derived category of modules over this, this quite large algebra lambda M. And inside of here, there is certainly some classical heart, which sort of looks like quiver representations if you enlarge your kind of sense of quiver representation to include these sort of infinite dimensional base rings that could show up. And this will correspond to, again, some category here, which will be generated under extensions inside of a certain heart of dbco by the objects f and the objects m. So you can arrange, again, with suitable hypotheses on m that are not restrictive in examples, you can arrange that all of the objects F and M lie in a single uh, heart of or the heart of a single T structure, which you build by kind of combining the Bridgeland notion of perverse coherent with the Deleen notion of perverse coherent. And then this kind of perv co M here is generated inside of this abelian category by these objects F and M. Let me write generated sort of sub ab to remember that we really mean like under extensions in this abelian category. And again, we deduce a statement that some kind of big stack, which now this is a kind of not well-behaved stack, which I didn't study too carefully because it, it didn't feature that prominently in its entirety so far, is equivalent in some formal sense to something you can a stack. Certainly, again, you can write it down, some kind of representations of a quiver, but you can't really quite say that you have a potential yet. It's just a quiver with relations so far. Um, okay, so now the goal is to kind of tame this big stack into an actual, uh, a more manageable stack of representations of a quiver with potential. So I wanted to say something about the way that you deduce the monad formalism, but I'm afraid I don't really have time. So I'll just say something briefly, which is, this causal duality equivalence that I explained on the previous page, again, following Balance and Ginsburg Zergel, you can compute the image of objects very explicitly. And it turns out that when you do, so we said that the, the objects F corresponded to certain injective objects. And you see that what happens is that under causal duality, the vector space underlying the injective module over the X algebra of the simples something like this on the left-hand side here in this example, 
naturally parametrizes the sort of multiplicities in the distinguished projective objects that occur in the causal resolution of the simple. So sort of the way that causal duality works and similarly for the framing objects. And as a result, you kind of naturally build the monad formalism by simply looking at the image of a certain heart inside of sigma modules of the objects in the heart. And when you look at their image under this functor computed in these explicit terms, you naturally find the uh, monad presentation of all of the sheaths in your category. And I, I wanted to spend more time on these examples, but I, I don't think I really have time, but it, it's, not, it's not too difficult to uh, kind of see what's going on here. Uh, and so now we can state the kind of main theorem, which again, it, it sort of is following from what we said above. First, this is the kind of already known folklore version without the framing, which says that you have some kind of equivalence of stacks, which now we're explicitly describing at the level of K points um, by this formula, which tells you if you have a quiver representation, you tensor the vector spaces in the quiver representation with the Kudul resolutions of the simple object. And then you deform the differential using the endomorphisms in the quiver representation tensored with certain distinguished maps between these Kuzula resolutions, which are representatives of the extension classes in terms of which we built these arrows between the vertices and the quiver in the first place. We kind of defined the quiver in terms of some extension classes between the compactly supported symbols. And then these come back at the end to tell us sort of how to build this monad formalism. And further, you can see that this presentation, as in, for example, Nakajima's proof of the kind of ADHM correspondence, this presentation can also be induced by the balance and spectral sequence applied to a certain canonical resolution of the diagonal that always occurs in this setting in terms of these distinguished projective generators, these EIs. So we prove this, but again, I think all of this was sort of folklore or would have been easily checked by experts. But we also extend this to include the additional framing object. And uh, well, let me not say much about this formula, but it's just to say that there are now maps from the framing to the main vertices and self loops at the framing node, which also have sort of an analogous uh, interpretation in the monad formalism. So finally, I just want to say something quickly about the framing structures. So I mentioned that this, this moduli space is not a space of representations of a quiver with potential. I wanted to rush through to this. I know there's just a couple of minutes left just to give a concrete example here of the kind of thing that's going on. So we can write down a formal potential using the same rules, which I didn't explain, but kind of asserted the same rules for writing down the potentials describing the quivers just for the threefolds. But the issue is somehow because the object M is not sort of proper, uh, there isn't an integration pairing that you can do at the end of the day, which is kind of a crucial step in actually literally writing down the potential. So this is the, a typical example. This is what you, you would get if you took the structure sheaf of C2 inside of C3. This is the framing you would get. As you can see, this looks a lot like the usual kind of three-dimensional generalization or tripled version of the ADHM quiver. But you get this extra self-loop at the framing vertex, which again, so far is not a framing vertex. In this description, we've really left it in as a generator and it's sort of free to do what it wants. But what you can prove is that under some mild hypotheses, there's a map from the stack of representations of this kind of giant quiver here to the stack of representations just of the framing part, where you kind of ignore the central term related to the actual threefold. And if you take the fiber over a particular choice of representation of the kind of framing quiver, that allows you to build a stack which is equivalent to representations of a quiver with potential, where you kind of fix the value of this auxiliary arrow here. So if you took your framing structure, which is this choice of iterated extension of the structure sheaf of C2 just to be the direct sum, then this AF term would just be zero and you get the usual 3D ADHM construction. But if you take it to be, oh, that's not supposed to say M direct sum to the R, that's supposed to say the structure sheaf 
of an, a kind of infinitesimally thickened copy of C2, sort of an arity R thickening of C2 inside of C3, then you end up with AF being a principal nilpotent and you rediscover this kind of modified version of the three-dimensional ADHM construction that was used in this paper of Chuang, Kreutzig, Diakonescu, and Soibelman in order to find uh, certain modules for the uh, a sort of alternative module, the vacuum module, for the affine W algebra in a kind of alternative ADHM story. And the upshot is that this theory of framing structures, uh, it, it kind of gives you a way to see all of these uh, these parabolic induction maps for uh, principal affine W algebras, even just in this simple example, this is the structure you find, by considering how these inver invariants vary as a sheaf over the space of choices of framing structure. Anyway, uh, obviously I have to stop. Sorry for going over and for the, uh, the rush at the end, but thanks very much for listening. Uh, yeah, thank you. Unfortunately, the most interesting part kind of was compressed in the in the in the very end. But tomorrow and on Friday you will not be that much restricted. Especially tomorrow you can talk as long as you want. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, 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 just uh, uh, one small uh, remark. You know there is some. Um, uh, um, categorical uh, formalism, uh, which says that if you have a three Calabi-Yau category with certain uh, collection of uh, generators, which satisfy some property, then uh, at, at least we, we proved with Maxim in 2008 that there is a bijection between equivalence classes of such A infinity categories and the categories coming from the quiver with the potential. So then uh, when you prove that your category is indeed equivalent to some category of modules, it's sort of slight upgrade. You do not just establish the equi bijection between equivalence classes, but actual equivalence of the category. Yeah, it's in that paper on, on, on DT invariance. There is some part in 2008, there is some part about quivers with potential. So then at least without framing, it, it I think it will give this quiver which corresponds to, to Y itself, compactly supported story, yeah. Excellent, great. Yeah, yeah I wasn't sure what the best reference was, but that, that's helpful, thanks. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, it was, you know, like 15 years ago, now probably it's just a common knowledge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it, it, as I was saying, it's thought it was yeah. understood. Um, uh -huh. But yeah, on the in the final lecture, I'll talk more about the details of the kind of correspondence with representation theory. And then I'll explain this kind of cryptic remark that I made here at the end. Um, there's a lot of, yeah, really nice parallels between the geometric story and the kind of representation theory of W algebras. But I'm not sure if tomorrow I'll be able to kind of fit it in with explaining everything, but I thought maybe in the final lecture I could say some more hey, adventurous some more stuff. Yeah. It's very good. Uh, so uh, we have time maybe for one more short question. Uh, other hmm, short questions <laughs> left because my I do have questions, but they are not short. Yeah. Mm. I, I will be looking forward to your how the vertex algebra will appear later on. It's not a yeah. question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to talk about it tomorrow. Okay, okay. I'll right. see you tomorrow. Uh, all right. So the next lecture will be tomorrow at 1 30. It's uh, 1 30 local time here, and whoever came here from a distance, you should subtract or add. Okay. Yeah. All right.